So next, we have a big, big treat for everyone. Uh, whether you know someone personally or have addressed it as a code official, hoarding is an issue that impacts countless lives and threatens the safety of citizens and communities across the country. Our keynote speaker might look familiar to you because he is one of the top extreme cleaning experts in the country and a star of the Emmy-nominated hit television show, Hoarders. Matt Paxton started cleaning out houses after his father and grandparents passed away in the same year. His company, Legacy Navigator, was founded on his expertise in extreme cleaning and his experience in managing his family's estates. Matt appears regularly as a public speaker, uh, television guest, and radio personality, talking about our emotional attachments to items and how to manage downsizing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matt Paxton. All right, I, I, I think my time is almost up, so we will, uh, that's a joke, I won't lie. All right, thank you guys for having me here. Um, I actually am born and raised here in Richmond, Virginia, so it's nice to have an event 15 minutes from my house. Uh, is there anybody here from Henrico County Code Enforcement? Raise your hand if you are. All right. I cut my teeth working with one code enforcement officer 15 years ago. There was a hoarded house. I was actually just starting to clean estates and cleaning out hoarded homes, and I wrote a letter to Henrico County, and I said, I can do all your hoarding work, and I spelt it H-O-R-D-I-N-G. I didn't even know how to spell the word hoarding. Uh, we have come a long way in 15 years. Hoarding is now a recognized mental disorder. It is a protected class, which will soon affect everything we do. Um, here's the crazy thing. I, it is the most intense job in the world. I clean really, really, really messy houses. This is one of my favorite. It is a hoarded house of a pet hoarder. This lady had 100 uh, parrots that would uh, fly around her house. And uh, that white stuff is not dirt. And uh, it was really, really, I'm in safe company here. I think I can tell these stories. And uh, this lady was, the birds were dive bombing us. It was a really, really difficult situation. I know you guys have seen it. But there's one thing that is consistent in a hoarded house, only one thing, and it's the code. The code is my one absolute. I can talk about communication, I can talk about what the piles mean, I can talk about everything, but the code is often what gets me in the front door. Uh, I like to say it's math. You can, you can really, any, any emotion is subjective, but the code, and I think some people would argue the code is subjective, but it's not in my world. It's an absolute, and it gives me a foot in the door. So I thank you guys for all the work you do. Uh, it actually makes my job a lot easier. Uh, so my background is really simple. I've cleaned thousands and thousands of hoarded houses. Uh, and they asked me to teach you a couple things about it. Um, I think this is important. We have to uh, acknowledge that hoarding is a recognized mental disorder, which is, means it is a protected class. That does change our career. The only thing that really matters is you understand there's always a reason. No hoarder would wake up and say, hey, I'm going to fill my house with 300 cats and 200 uh, used diapers. That would be a really good idea. No one would choose to live this way. They can't help it. They might communicate in a negative fashion with us. But at the end of the day, there is a reason they've done it. That reason is loss. Grief, loss, something bad has happened to them. And that is the way they're behaving this way. Now, the message today is not going to be about that. Uh, my class this afternoon, please come. I'll get more details of understanding hoarding. People always want to know why in the world would you clean the messiest homes in the country? Why would I choose this job? Uh, well, I failed at everything else, to be really, really blunt. <laughs> and there's, let's put a pin in that. That word failure is really, really important. Right? Believe it or not, I went to Mary Washington College, a small little girl's school, uh, about an hour north of here. They were letting, trying to let guys go to the school, so I got in uh, basically on a waiver and, uh, and almost failed out, uh, but I had a really good time. And, uh, <laughs> and I went to, it was a great place. It was eight, eight to one ratio. Um, I ended up getting a job as an economist with the Federal Reserve, and I knew within two weeks I didn't want to work for the government. And uh, I ended up taking a job at, at Las Vegas, at Caesars Palace, and I became an economist for Caesars Palace Casinos. Um, it was as fun as you can imagine. 23 years old, living on the seventh floor, on the strip, in Vegas, no wife, no kids, and honestly, no morals. It was a really fascinating summer. 
Uh, they moved me to Lake Tahoe to sober me up. And if you've ever spent a weekend in Lake Tahoe, uh, that's like moving to Chicago to lose weight. It's the wrong city for that goal. If you're from Chicago, that's a hilarious joke. Uh, I ended up coming home because, uh, as she mentioned, he mentioned earlier, I lost, that summer I lost my dad, my stepdad, and both my grandfathers. The four men that raised me passed away. Um, not related, just, a, just bad luck. And I found myself very quickly with four houses to clean. Very, four very full houses. Uh, and it sucked. I was lost, I was grieving, I didn't know what to do. Uh, the physical side of it was overwhelming, and the emotional side was overwhelming. And my grandfather's always said to me, if something sucks, do it for a job. Because someone will pay you to do it. Right? And so I did, started to clean these houses. I did have a little bit of a detour. I went back to Caesar's Palace to wrap up a few things. Uh, that goes longer than you want it to. Uh, I ended up owing a bookie $40,000. Not fun. Not fun at all. Um, I found myself needing to come up with 40 grand in two days. I didn't make 40 grand total in a year. I had a thousand bucks. I called my bookie. I said, hey man, I got a thousand bucks. Can we work this out? And he said, sure. No worries. Come on down. Let's work it out. Very naively. You're right, sir. Very naively. I drove down the mountain and I, uh, I said, hey, here's a thousand bucks. Let's work it out. Let's work out a payment plan. And honestly, he broke my nose. He beat me up pretty poorly. And he said, you have one more day to come up with 40 grand. Now, the options you put on the table at that moment are not good. They're not good at all. Uh, luckily, I'd worked for the Federal Reserve. I knew how to properly rob a bank. So I felt like that was my best <laughs> option. All right, some of you are going to want to take notes on this. Um, I knew. <laughs> I knew that and this is back in 1999, and so it was pre, I mean, it was, cash was still king. And it was a Thursday, and I had to pay the money by Friday. Well, Friday's the worst day to rob a bank because all the money is going out for payroll. The best day to rob a bank is on Monday because all the money's coming in from the retail stores. Well, it was Thursday. I had no, ch I really wanted a lot of money. I also knew that. If you stick around, the odds of getting caught for one drawer are very small. If you stick around for two drawers, you're really going to get caught. If you stick around for three drawers, almost every person that sticks around for three drawers gets caught. There's about $8,000 in each drawer at, at peak point. So do the math. I had to hit five banks one drawer at a time to come up with $40,000. <laughs> and as a respectable economist, I knew those were not good odds. Why am I telling you the story? I had to take a Illogical, de uh, illogical decision off the table for operational reasons. Right? Next option was call my mom. I needed the money. Uh, when you call your mom and ask her for $40,000 to pay off a bookie, uh, that conversation does not go well. She said, you're on your own. Find a legal way out of this and hung up. I respect my mom now as an adult with three children. At the time, I was not stoked about that decision. I then said, all right, I'll just prostitute myself. And I got to tell you, this is not going to make $40,000 in any amount of time, <laughs> more or less two days. And the math on that is disturbing, I can assure you. <laughs> don't ever go there. So my best decision was to kill myself. And I don't say that lightly. I knew that was my best way out. If I just killed myself, ended my life, nobody would get hurt. And I had actually picked out the place on the mountain in Lake Tahoe was coming down Mott's Canyon. and I knew where I was going to run my car off the mountain because that was the best way for me to end this. But luckily, my bookie had said, if you kill yourself, I'm coming after your mom for the money. And my mom would kill me if that happened. So I knew I didn't have the option. So I came home. I begged and begged and begged and begged. And I, well, one person actually did help me pay off this bookie. I got home. I had no job. My dad had just died. I started cleaning the house. Then I started cleaning another house, then another house. And Henrico County gave me one job to clean. It was a hoarded house. Like I said, I didn't even know how to spell the word hoard. And I found out one thing. The lady's house that I was cleaning was really, really sad. Really, really sad. Right? Just like I was. I was lost. I didn't know what to do. 
And I learned really quickly at that moment, and I was telling her, uh, this was actually not a hoarded house. This was my grandma's house. That's actually my grandma in the picture right there. I was cleaning my grandma's attic, and she was really, really, really upset. She said, I can't believe that I've got to have somebody here. I can't believe I've got to get help with this. And I said, yeah, Nanny, I don't know if you want to know this, but I actually thought about prostituting my suit, prostitute myself to pay off my bookie $40,000. She says, that's horrible. I said, I know, but it's not so bad as this garage being too bad. And I very, very quickly learned that it wasn't really about the stuff. This was 15 years ago. This is before I was on TV. This is before I'd written books, before I'd done any public speaking. I was just some dude in a basement, and I realized it's the emotions that are attached to the stuff. It's not about the stuff. And when I'm telling you this, it's important for you guys because you have seen thousands and thousands of houses. And sometimes we forget, why is this happening? We totally forget this is a real person. If you ever heard me speak before, if you work on any of my crews, the one thing I say is, this is somebody's grandma. Treat it as if it's yours. We sometimes forget that respect for our clients. Sometimes we forget that they've gone through a lot of trauma, just like I had. I had a very, very quick entrepreneurial uh, process after that. I was starting to clean houses a little bit, but I didn't really take on too much. So I started a wetsuit company called Xterra Wetsuits, believe it or not. That was my first business. Um, I forgot to put the zippers on the first round of wetsuits. <laughs> so that didn't go very well. Uh, somebody bought me out. He put zippers on them and sold them all. I then started Bling Bling Pizza. This was my favorite. This was a personal pan, plan, a personal pan pizza for adults. It's basically a happy meal for college kids. I put a fake gold chain in the pizza box, and I thought college kids would buy it. Uh, they did not. <laughs> I did very poorly. It was called Bling Bling Pizza. Uh, then a pre-sliced slimes. That's probably my favorite, uh, one of my favorite inventions. I was sitting around. And I said, no one's buying Corona. We need to pre-cut those limes so they'll buy more Corona. It's a pretty good idea. Budweiser liked it. Then they started uh, Bud Light Lime. And uh, <laughs> I didn't do so well with that. Then I started my claim to fame, Paxton Sandal Saver. It was an all-natural cleaner for your flip-flops and sandals. And uh, I traveled around the country and did that for four years. There's a theme here. What's the theme so far? Failing. A lot. There's a lot of, a lot of hope and a lot of belief that I could do something well. I started going to a camp here in Richmond, Virginia called Comfort Zone Camp. It's a grief camp for children that have lost their parents. I had lost my dad. These kids I met had lost their dads. We'd go camping. We'd hang out. We'd talk about that loss, right? You hear the theme, failure, loss, failure, loss. Two years, I did this camp every single weekend that I could. I ended up meeting the person that would then become my wife. I then ended up really creating the company. I had started cleaning houses very long, but this really let me understand, wait a minute, there's a lot more to grief, there's a lot more to loss. And so I started my business at this camp, I met my eventual family at this camp, and it really got me kind of out of my shell. Uh, so I then started Clutter Cleaner, which you saw me do on TV. TV was simple. Nobody wanted to do that show. They asked hundreds of people to be on this TV show called Hoarders. Um, I agreed to do it because I was trying to get a newspaper article written about me, uh, which is the irony in that 10 years later. Um, I started cleaning, and I would clean it. The answer was yes. If someone asked me to clean it, I'd do it. Finally got back with Henrico County. There was a guy named John Butler. Paula Johnson, raise your hand here. A lot of y'all know Paula. She was my contact up in Northern Virginia. She started helping me clean out houses. She would tell me where to go. And I just buried myself in those houses. And I've been cleaning them now for 15 years. And, I, and it all comes back to the golf bag. All right? 15 years later, all that failure, what it comes down to is emotions. All right? No one ever cares about the stuff. My whole TV show is about what? Stuff, but not really. It's the people that are attached to them. Half my business now, 15 years later, is cleaning out estates after someone's passed away. I help families downsize. Guess what families fight over and break up over? Stuff. And it's usually the dining room, or, which by the way, nobody wants anything in the dining room, all right? 
China does a marry more, the dining room cabinet, all the stuff families used to break over, they don't care anymore, all right? A lot of the stuff, you're, the houses you're going to, it keeps coming back to the stuff, all right? Um, I had a really, really good run hiring ex-cons. Why would I do that? Why would ex-cons be really good at working with hoarders? They understand loss. They understand isolation, sometimes literally. Right. I had one guy that worked for me. He did 20 years in prison. He came out, worked for me for eight years. One lady could not let go of her things. He said, ma'am, I need to talk to you. He said, there was a point where all I had to my whole entire self life was a book, one book that I earned the right to read. He goes, I understand not wanting to let go of things. And then they went off, and I don't know what they talked about. I still to this day don't know what they talked about. But when they came back, she was ready to let go of things. All right? There are many, many people that suck at one job. And there are many, many people that are good at one, another job. I happen to be the best at hoarding cleanup because I failed. I had 15 years of failing. Right? And I can look back and I can talk to my hoarders and I tell my stories and I say, yeah, everybody says, man, your stories must be crazy about hoarding. Not as wild as the stories my hoarders tell me. Right? Their losses, their grief, their experiences. By the way, some of the hoarders I work with are some of the most fascinating people you ever meet. I mean, just this week, I met a guy that ran track with Jesse Owens. I mean, he was the first track coach at Ohio State. He was an Olympic track coach. I found an Olympic medal in this house. That's amazing. He now currently struggles with hoarding. Is that the most fascinating thing about him, his hoarding disorder? No, it's the least exciting thing about him. I, mean, I could tell you a thousand stories about fascinating hoarders. I found uh, $2 million in gold bars one time in a house. Still don't know how they got the gold bars. I'd like to know. All right. I'd love to know. The family still won't tell me. But we focus so much on who they are right now because the hoarding is what's in our face. But there is oftentimes 60, 70 years of a much more fascinating person behind all that stuff. And our job is to find out that story. Mm -hmm. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. I had an opportunity, if you ever watched TV show Hoarders, they came to me in season uh, six. We're on season 10 right now, which is amazing. And they said, we want you to spend the night in hoarded houses. I said, no, I'm good. I think I'm fine, I'm fine with that. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 we think you can learn a lot more about hoarding. I said, man, I know everything about hoarding. I've written the books. I'm on the TV show. I'm good. You can't teach me anything. So I went to my lawyer and I said, should I do this? He was like, absolutely not. Talked to my insurance person. She said, no way. And I talked to my mom. She said, it's a horrible idea. So I went back to the network. I said, hey, guys, no amount of money. I'm sorry. I can't do this. And about 10 minutes later, we found out there actually is a specific amount of money you can pay me <laughs> to make me spend the night in a hoarded house. Yeah. I had three kids, man. I had three kids. Four two and one year old boys. I had, to, I had to go spend the night in the houses. All right, long story short is I did it for the money, which is always the wrong decision. All right. I went and I forgot in the emotional side of this. I went in thinking I could handle anything. Um, what I learned in these houses was very quickly, um, when you lose vision, when you can no longer see anything, it's a totally different lesson. All right. I thought I knew everything about hoarded houses. The minute the lights went out and the power didn't want, I used to never understand, well, why would a hoarder, why would they sleep in the bathtub? Why would they sleep in the Lazy Boy? Why wouldn't they figure something out? Why can't they see to do something differently? Well, every time I spent the night in the house, the first time I had a rental car, I had a wallet, I had options. So I stayed for a few hours and then I was like, screw this, I'm going to the hotel. And I left. Because why? I could. Right? Next time I said, ah, take away my rental car. Right? But we're still camera guys there. So I ended up sleeping in their van about four hours later. Right? Every time I had to say, take away more options. The very last time I said, don't give me anything. Take my wallet, take my jacket, give me nothing. I need to be raw in this house. It was hands down the worst moment of my life. I remember seeing 
a hose in the living room, but I didn't know if it was a hose or a snake, and I couldn't see. It was so hot, this was in California, it was so hot that I could feel this, my sweat coming down, but I didn't know if it was sweat or if it was a spider. Right. I found something hit my face. I had fallen, I got kind of stuck, and I couldn't move. This arm was stuck under a bunch. I knew they were actually encyclopedias because I'd moved so many encyclopedias that I knew what they felt like. Right. But I couldn't move my arm. I was stuck, and I felt something on my face, and I rolled it, and it felt like food or a hot dog or something, but I didn't want to know what it was. Right. And my final result was, I'm just going to sleep outside in the ditch. And why did I sleep in the ditch? Because it was the best option I had. I mean, what I learned was every night, our hoarders, it's like they take a red eye every night from California. Anybody ever taken a red eye from California to the East Coast? It's exhausting. And they do it night after night after night after night, 10, 20, sometimes 30 years in a row. I mean, they're emotionally drained. They're just trying to get through the night. And what I learned was, you will absolutely sleep in the tub. You'll absolutely sleep in the ditch. Because at that moment, it's the best option you got. Right? And I, I thought I knew everything about hoarding. Turns out, I didn't know anything about hoarding. I only knew what the houses looked like at night. Right? What makes me so good at hoarding, and I don't mean to brag. I sound like Donald Trump bragging about everything. The reality is, I failed everywhere I went. Right? And now I'm looking back almost 20 years later, and I was looking back at these pictures. Man, it was awesome. I loved failing. It gave me all the experience that I have. And it actually didn't make sense. I mean, I prayed and prayed and prayed to get my life together along the way. This was my college roommate who invent, he invested when I was about to lose my sandal business. He invested in me. When I started my clutter business, guess what? He invested in me. And when I went on TV, guess what? He invested in me, all right? And I've taken that back to my hoarders. What do I do when I see them lost? I invest in them, not financially. I invest in them emotionally, all right? These are real people. These are people that have lost a lot. And guess who the first person in the front door normally is? Is you. Rarely do they have other interaction. Code enforcement or APS is usually the first person that knocks on that door. Mm -hmm. And it's up to you to understand, hey, this isn't about the stuff. There's a real person here that has had actual trauma, and I can make a difference. I can actually help someone. We just did an hour award ceremony, and I was so fun to watch, especially you, I was so fun to watch your friends watch you. Sorry to point you out. It was so cool to watch your friends and family watch you win this award. They're so proud of you. You guys, as an industry, support each other heavily. We just had the group from California. Their whole team came up to support their boss. That doesn't happen in every industry, let me assure you. All right, this is a very cool thing to see. So let's make sure we take it to our clients as well. We need to support them as much. We need to get as excited about them. I think I'm talking to a lot of the higher up people, but we can teach this down to everyone in our system because they need to know that these are, these are awesome, really good, fascinating people, my hoarders are. They just happen to currently right now be having a hard time with hoarding. And we're the one person that's interacting with them. Right? I tell everybody, embrace your failures It'll make you really good at your job. If you haven't failed at your age yet, you're boring. I don't want to hang out with you. All right? We live in a very Facebook society. We try to make sure everything looks perfect, which, by the way, the more perfect someone looks on Facebook, I think the more of a lie it actually is. All right? So drop the PC. Drop being perfect. And when you have a chance to interact with one of your clients, pause for five seconds, sit down, get to know them, understand the why. Because chances are, you're going to relate heavily with them. And when you understand that their failures are very similar to your failures, guess what? You're going to have a new friend. And then they're not a client that's pointing at each other. That whole 15-minute montage was people what? Hugging each other. Right? If you did a montage of my last 20 years, it's me hanging out with a bunch of hoarders hugging each other. Right? And that's how you get to be really, really, really good 
at cleaning houses is dropping all that other crap, not worrying about all the failures, and being equal side by side with the person you're helping. All right, I think we're wrapping it up. All right, that was a very quick thing. I hope you learned something, and I hope you'll take it back with you and teach your team this is about the emotions, not the stuff. And come see my class later this afternoon.